hello and good morning, everybody. Or is it afternoon? If it's right in the middle, I guess it's afternoon now because we're past noon. Uh, welcome and good afternoon to you. This is the All Portable Discussion Zone, a bi-weekly live stream all about amateur radio portable ops. My name is Charlie. Call sign is November Juliet 7 Victor. And with me this afternoon is Dan, KC7 MSU, one of the co-hosts uh, of the show. Unfortunately, uh, Brian, W7JET, couldn't make it, so he won't be here. And of course, we are pleased to announce and uh, uh, today's guest, which is Pete Giuliani, N6, uh, Giuliano, uh, N6QW. And uh, I, we also want to uh, recognize all of you in the chat room. Uh, we're happy you're here. Hope you stick with us this afternoon. And if you have any comments or questions, please go ahead and pop those in the uh, chat and we'll be sure to answer them. So first of all, let's get caught up on what's been going on. I am going to go first today. And uh, actually, I want to just share a little picture of what I've been up to here for a minute. Let me share my screen and I'll show you. I've been doing some soda again. It's I'm, I'm uh, guilty again of doing soda. So uh, what was it? Uh, Thursday, I took the day off and I uh, drove up to Flagstaff, Arizona to meet my friend Malin, VE6VID, from the Calgary area in Canada. He drove down here and he's doing summits on the air. And so this is a look at what we were doing. We were out there hiking mountains. And uh, so there's still snow on the, on the mountains up there in Flagstaff. So uh, that it was a cool day, but it was it was kind of warm at the same time, just perfect. And there's this road that we were we, ten miles round trip walking this road. There was some off trail hiking as well, but this this road was probably about eight of it, <laughs> so not bad. And uh, here's a picture of a of Malin and I on top of the summit after we had uh, had uh, worked our QRP contacts for a while. And so that's the first thing I've been up to. And then second of all, I'm excited because look right here. I am going to be building a radio from scratch, and these are the the uh, I guess the shipments from Mauser. I've also have a, a, a large supply of my own stuff, so I just kind of gathering everything together and getting ready to start out on this this adventure. I'm gonna I'm gonna eventually end up with a N6QW uh, SSB sudden transceiver. So uh, in the end, but right now we're just gonna work on the audio amplifier. So that's what I've been up to. Uh, let's turn it over to Dan for a minute and see what he's been got going on. Hey, Charlie. Well, not nothing quite that exciting, but uh, I I did finally get my about last four or five activations uh, actually put in. So I've got a few more points, which is uh, pretty nice. And uh, I'm on task to uh, surpass my 2020 three summit count uh already this year so i'm 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 happy about that uh planning for next weekend's uh hopeful trip to uh do uh spitz hill uh next weekend and then at least do that one and then uh the weekend after that uh so two weekends in a row potentially coming up for some summit fun Fun. Good. Yeah. You, you got to just get it in when you can, don't you? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And then our, our, our guest, Pete, Pete, what have you been up to the last few weeks or whatever? Well, for, for those that listen to the podcast, I re regularly participate in solder smoke uh, podcast. Um, my time is uh, very limited. My, my wife is in not good health and she's in a board and care facility. So uh, I have a daily schedule that uh, I go there twice a day. So it doesn't leave much time to, uh, break out the soldering iron, but a few little projects. Uh, I had a chance to, someone passed on to me a Raspberry Pi 0W, which is like half a credit card size, and that's kind of interesting what you can do, and it's, so I played around with that a little bit. Uh, there was no soldering involved, just a little time with the computer, and then uh, one other interesting thing that I did do, uh, I had always wanted to try one of my, uh, one of my final amplifier designs using the IR510, and typically you operate those off of 12 volts, and uh, so I have a, um, a DC to DC inverter from Meanwell, uh, 9 to 18 volts in, produces 24 volts out. And uh, I hook that up and uh, wow, <laughs> boy, that sure juices up the output. So uh, uh, yeah. something like that uh, for portable operation um, has some possibilities that uh, 
you know, if you need 24 volts, uh, that's a cute little device to produce 24 volts. So you take it out there in the field, especially if you want to give it a little more juice uh, out, of, out of your rig. And uh, these things are like 20 bucks, so not a lot of money. And so I've been doing a little work with that. It's got a little bit of a noise problem, so that's always uh, a concern. But uh, I said, okay, no no wire solder. Just clip some. So clip leads to it. You can run a quick test. So I'm kind of encouraged by what I can see. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah, that's, that's good. And where, where do you get that at? Uh, a good source supplier for the Meanwell, believe it or not, is a company up in the Bay Area called Jameco Electronics. Oh, J-A-M-E-C-O yeah. Electronics. And by the way, they are an excellent source of those little teeny tiny ceramic trimmers yes. that you're always looking for for projects. Uh, they've got really good pricing on them, uh, and they're they're a good source. Now they do have a minimum buy, so uh, the minimum buy is like twenty five bucks, and it's not hard to hit twenty five dollars. But uh, you know that's a good good company to get some uh, get a group buy with. You know if you you and Dan, for instance, are working on a project and you both need those little trimmers, uh, boy, that's a great place. And they're MPO and they're good for two hundred fifty volts, so they work real well in solid state circuits. Okay, good, good. Cool. All right. Well, I guess we're all caught up then. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of take go back and forth with Dan and I asking questions, I think, and and uh, we'll get going then. So uh, first question, I, I just want to know a little bit about your background when you were younger, uh, like your your young adult years or even your teenage years or younger. Just kind of what 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 was it like in the uh, Giuliano household back then? Well, it's kind of interesting. I, I got started in radio uh, in the in the late. 40s uh i'm an old dude in the late 40s my dad uh my dad built a crystal set and it just totally amazed me that you know with no batteries <laughs> here you were you could hear radios now i lived outside of pittsburgh and uh in a small town about 20 miles north of pittsburgh didn't take much of an antenna to copy kdka which was a 50,000 watt clear channel station so uh that started me off and then uh back in 1954 I got my first solid state device, a CK720, Raytheon CK722 transistor. Really interesting story about those transistors. Uh, some marketing guy was really clever. Raytheon was trying to build transistors for the government. And, and the high end one was called a CK768, which was good at HF frequencies. And, the, and if you do any work in the semiconductor industry, and I did, uh, you'll find that the yields initially were not very great. As a matter of fact, if you had a, a VLSI facility and you got about a 10% yield, you were doing good. <laughs> now they're, they're, they're up there getting, you know, and all subject to clean room. So they had this big pile of transistors that didn't make the CK768 spec. Someone says, what do you do with them? <laughs> we'll sell them to hams. They renumbered them to the CK722. They had they worked, but they were derated, so they're only good for audio. So the very first kind of the very first project I built was an audio amplifier for my crystal set. So mm. it just just kind of amazing to see where the technology has taken us from from the 50s uh, up to today. And and really, uh, if you kind of look at uh, where we're at today, it was up until 1960s. Mostly everything was tubes, and then from there on. And then I, I uh, piddled around with a lot of electronics in my uh, teenage years. And then finally, it was <laughs> it was a high school project that uh, caused me to actually get a ticket. I, I was dancing around it, kept saying, hey, I'm going to get a license. I'm, you know, but I was having so, fun, so much fun building stuff. We had to do something. So I, I wrote a project, uh, project up about am, getting becoming a ham. And so I said, well, maybe this is a good time to do it. And so here I am in high school in my senior year, and I got my ham ticket as a result of a, being forced to do it from a high school project. And of course, uh, if you fast forward to the late 50s, the Sputnik yeah. dramatically yeah. changed what happened here in the United States. All the high schools immediately focused on science and technology, and everybody had to become an engineer. So I studied engineering, electrical engineering. And uh, it, I'm not sure that was what I really wanted to do, but everybody was doing it. So here you go. And it kind of worked with the hobby. You know, it was kind of, it was sort of my hobbies turned into a life's work, but uh, I, I, I do have a degree in electrical engineering. Although uh, after college, I went to school on a Navy scholarship, spent four years in the Navy. And after I got out, I did, uh, I did end up working in aerospace. 
which is kind of fascinating because I got the chance to see a lot of things that now are commonplace, but were leading edge uh, at that time. And so I uh, spent most of my working life in aerospace, worked for McDonnell Douglas, which is now Boeing. And uh, as a matter of fact, right there in downtown Mesa, you can see some of my handiwork, the plant on Power, uh, yeah. Power Road and, and – uh, I forget what the cross street is. Uh, uh, let's see what was it? Well, it's the 202 now. There's a big freeway out there. Yeah, it, well, it starts with an M. I keep uh, forgetting. McA- McDowell or McKillops? McKillops. McKillops. Yeah. Pie Road, McKillops. That site was a bare piece of land back in 1980, and I put the plant in there. Well, they had an assembly facility, but all the office buildings and everything else. I, I spent four wonderful years in, in Mesa, Arizona. And uh, I, I'll tell you, you guys are lucky because you where you live there in Mesa, you actually have access to parts. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you got circuit specialists, you got antique electronic supply. As a matter of fact, antique electronic supply used to be on University Avenue in Tempe before they moved it to the current facility. And at that time, it was owned by a father and a son. And I'd go in there on Saturday, and I knew the guy, George, who originally owned it, and then he sold it to some company now that is antique electronic supply. I said, I'm looking for something. He said, you know where they're at, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. It was that kind of a thing, you know. So, uh, but I spent most of my uh, working life in aerospace and retired here 25 years ago. And I, as soon as I could get out, I got out. Yeah. Because, yeah you know, that's for you. a brutal industry, but uh, kind of interesting to see how things have changed. And it wasn't until really the I got out of working normally that I really started, could spend some time with the, with the electrons. So a lot of the stuff that you're seeing on websites and what have you is all post- working it's all a retirement where you actually have some time and you have some money <laughs> yeah <laughs> <we're going>. <laughs> you know it's either send the kid off to college or buy a new radio that sort of thing yeah yeah so cool that's kind of a cap so i have four kids three boys a girl none of them are interested in amateur radio although uh two of them sort of dabble in electronics but uh, never was interested in getting a ticket or getting on the air okay i have uh, some follow-up questions uh so many, actually, I don't know even where to start, but we'll just add, I'll, I'll limit it. I'll, I'll ask one or two and then we'll turn it over to Dan. So the one is when you were younger, um, I'll just limit it to one. And so when you were younger, like, say, 10, 12, 14 years old, did you have other interests other than like uh, electronics and stuff like that? Did you, did you go out and play play baseball on the field or anything like that or hang out with friends in any other way? Well, uh not really. And the reason is an uh, interesting situation. Up until I was about in third grade, we lived in the city. And so uh, I went to the school not too far away. And, and after third grade, my, my parents moved to the country and built a house out in the country. So there weren't a lot oh. of people around and things of that sort. Yeah. So that was another, another way of keeping occupied was the yeah. hobby, you know, yeah. spending a lot of time hobby. So it wasn't really to do that. But I, I will say that uh, uh, had I known what I know today, <laughs> I would have spent a lot more time chasing girls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Forget this electronic stuff. <laughs> there you go. All right. One last comment. Uh, can you tell us, you were talking to me uh, yesterday about uh, the TV thing. I- I'd like it, I'd like you to tell that if you would. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of funny in early 1950s and this is really early like 1951 or so um my folks bought a tv set and not uh, we had quite an extended family in this little town and not everybody had a tv set so on sunday night we suddenly would have company every sunday night and there were two stations in the pittsburgh area kdka channel two and wta channel four and Channel two and four, just above the six meter band. That's why there is no channel one, because that is the six meter band. So they would come up and competing at eight, at the eight o'clock time slot was Ed Sullivan on, on KDKA and WTA had the Colgate Comedy Hour and had Abbott and Costello, Lewis and Martin, Dale and Lewis. I mean, really good comedy stuff kind of stuff that you really appreciate and then you could listen to Reese Stevens or Topo Chijo the singing mouse <laughs> you know <laughs> so family would come and I said god I wish I could do something and I saw this article in radio electronics where back in the day when people used to have to know code to get a license you either had code records or you had an EF Johnson code buzzer 
and this code buzzer had a little adjustment on it, and it it was a spark. It was it was like a spark cap, a little small spark cap. And they still sell these SpeedX buzzers. You can find them on on eBay. And I saw this article in Radio Electronics that said you could actually put a two network on on that buzzer, and even though it was like a spark cap, you could limit the bandwidth of where you're instead of broadcasting over the whole spectrum you could limit it so i said gee that's kind of interesting and i kind of put one together and i noticed the tv was on and when you hook that spark you got up because the front ends were as broad as a barn door it would wipe out the tv so the light bulb went out, <laughs> <laughs> light bulb went out. <laughs> so i built one of the cigar box when they when the family would come over and they put on channel two i silently hit the button and suddenly the TV would go like this, and so they said, "Well, let's try the other channel because typically that was a that was a problem with the early TV sets. They turned it to four, I turned it off, and there was four on four. It took a while for my dad to catch on. It was me. <laughs> was doing it. I was ten years old, and I figured out. I said, "Technology. There's always an answer with technologies." There you go. That's good. I like that. <laughs> oh. So when you were younger, did um, I don't know? For me, this was something that I always did. Did you pretty much so take everything apart in the house to see how it how it actually worked? Yeah, I did did do that, and and that was always kind of fun. But what was interesting is my dad had a very much an interest in electronics as a kid. As a kid, he built crystal sets, and and really enjoyed it. But he never went beyond that. But certainly, uh, and he worked in, he actually worked in downtown Pittsburgh. And believe it or not, they had some surplus stores. So every once in a while, he'd come home. If I was a good boy, <laughs> he'd come home and said, here, you can do something with this. It was some electronic thing, you know. So I, I was always fooling with stuff because my dad says it's, he'd rather see me do something constructive than to get into trouble. So it's kind of interesting. But I was always taking stuff apart. And it's kind of interesting because my number three son, he's like that. He used to take apart everything in the house, and he's a mechanical engineer dealing in robotics. So it, it, it kind of that, at least that piece of it kind of passed on in the family. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Even in, uh, I mean, there used to be a lot of reclaim uh, places here in Arizona, in the Phoenix area. Apache Reclamation Electronics. Yeah. <laughs> Seventh even- Street. Seventh Avenue, yeah. And even that one is gone now. It finally oh, you're closed kidding. down. No, but we used to spend, you know, we'd go down there twice a week and during school and pick things out, you know, and take them apart and, you know, find, you know, all kinds of parts you couldn't afford. So, yeah, even that's gone nowadays. I remember Apache Reclamation Electronics. It's always good to have big hands. They had a barrel full of transistors. And they'd say, put your hand in there and grab a handful of transistors, put them in the paper bag, take them up to the front counter, and they charge you a buck. And I had big hands. <laughs> 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 so it always worked. Another, another time, my, my favorite story about Apache Reclamation Electronics, they, they knew a lot of stuff for what they had, but a lot they didn't. This is 1980, and I spotted this little box, and it had 12 mini circuits SBL1s in there, double balance mixers. Mm. At that time, one of those was about fifteen to twenty dollars. One. Whoa. So it was a whole box, twelve of them. So I took it up to the front counter and the guy says, What are these things? I said, I don't know. They look kind of interesting to me. He said, They look like relays. I said, Yeah, they probably are. He says, How about a quarter a piece? <laughs> 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 I said, Okay, yeah, I guess I could take a I, I'll take a take a chance with those. So I had a dozen of SBL1. So some of the stuff, they didn't know what was going on, but a lot of it they did. Of course, it always bothered me. They were they were recycling batteries out in the back. They had these guys burning the case of <laughs> batteries and reclaiming the lead. What? I said, what about those fumes? No way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah. Wouldn't want that job. Good old no, days, no. eh? <laughs> All right. Well, so Pete, do you, um, it's obvious you, you do a lot of home brewing. That's why we have you on all kinds. You've made all kinds of stuff, but, and have a lot of experience I'm wondering if you have a favorite receiver design. Um, I mean, what works good, you know, there's regenerative direct conversion, super hedge, right? What, what, what do you think about the, the different designs and what one maybe a beginner might go with? Well, um, 
of course, a lot of the stuff is more recent technology. But back when I was building a lot of small receivers, and that, of course, regenerative was the, was the type receiver. Man, those things were touchy, and they were all over the place. Of course, uh, there were a couple of well-known kits that were sold that were regenerative receivers. The Knight Kit Space Spanner for $13.95 was a regen receiver. If you can find a good one on eBay right now, they get a couple hundred bucks for those. But there's since time has passed now, uh, long about 1968, Wes Hayward made, made popular the direct conversion receiver, which yeah. is, is not a regen, but it's a direct conversion. And, and those work really, really nice. Um, and of course, uh, you, you know, you build a, of course, a super head. And, and it's interesting to see because in, I always use this analogy in, in the late 50s, a 100 watt transmitter was two racks of equipment. One rack was the power supply, and the other rack was the actual <laughs> transmitter. And, and of course, uh, building receivers before the introduction of solid state were all vacuum tubes. So you, first you started with the green lead chassis punch, and you cut holes in the chassis, and you mounted all the hardware. So a lot of the time you're, you're spent building stuff was uh, focused on mechanical construction. So... Today, uh, I think the single single conversion receiver, if you're going to build something that, with a crystal filter, what have you, double conversion is a little more difficult, and you got to be very concerned about things that you do. But uh, certainly, if you want a quick and dirty, workable, good-sounding receiver, the direct conversion receiver is probably one of the, 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 the best things that you can do. And you have some options with regard to a direct conversion receiver. You can use a package double balance mixer like the SBL1 or the AD1 or the Tough One or the Tough Three. That's pretty simple. And you have a little bandpass filter. You might need a little RF amplifier in the front end of that and a local oscillator, audio amp on the back end, and you're in business. Uh, you can move up from there and use like the, the NE602, like in the sudden, uh, a lot of direct conversion receivers in there. I think it's interesting is the NE602 has the capability on pin six and seven. You can turn that into the VFO. So you need you do not need a separate LO. You just put a front end on that and feed the signal in there and put a, put an LC network and you can tune it. Um, a step up from that is the um, double balance mixer, the MC1496. Uh, on my U YouTube channel, there's a MC1496 receiver on there that I built a couple years ago. As a matter of fact, it was the subject of an article in the GQRP Sprat. And I have received about close to 200 requests for the code, for the Arduino <laughs> code, because there's, there's an Arduino driving that. And they're all from all over the world. Now, I, I don't think 200 got built, but I, I'd say at least half of those got built. And, and the frequent comment you get is, this thing really sounds good because the direct conversion has such a presence to it. So I'd say today, if you want to start up building something, uh, a direct conversion receiver would be a really good place to start. Now, if you go to my website, n6qw.com, you'll right at the very top, you'll see a link that says, uh, let's build something. That was a two-part article that appeared in QRP Quarterly. And the first part of the article starts off with a direct conversion receiver. So it has you build a direct conversion receiver. And this direct conversion receiver, the, the nice part about that is, is everything that you build in the direct conversion receiver can be moved up into a single sideband tra transceiver. So part two takes the direct conversion receiver, takes everything that you built, and moves it right in to becoming the uh, single sideband transceiver. So that would be a good place to start. It's a very first link at the top top of the page let's build something and that'd be a good place to start because what's the website called again n6qw.com and it's called let's build something let's see it's at the top of the top of the page yep, there, right there you go the first there. Yeah. top of the page yeah 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 all right here's the there's, a, there's the there's the picture there's the first first part of the article with the direct conversion receiver matter of fact the shaded in blocks are the direct conversion receiver that shows how they're integrated into the into the block diagram for the single sideband transceiver. So that's the second part two is a single sideband transceiver. And then if you're really getting adventurous, the third link on, on that page 
is I converted that to a surface mount design. So the, the third article says it's the same. Let's build something, the transceiver part. And then I made a made it all surface mount. And that was an interesting experience. You learned some things about surface mount that, that you didn't think about. I, le I learned something about surface mount, especially extensive use of surface mount that I hadn't thought of before. Yeah. So uh, what was the purpose then of, of creating this article? It's, I'm assuming it was you wanted to get uh, promote homebrew and you wanted to give people an idea of what they could do yeah. to get started. Well, this was uh, shortly after I moved back to Southern California, I ran into a local ham here and he was just sort of getting started. I mean, he, he had a technical background, but he hadn't built very much. So I said, you know, we ought to create an article because by that time I had published uh, half a dozen or so articles in QRP quarterly. I said, let's publish an article called Let's Build Something so that we can take you step by step with a somewhat simple project, the direct conversion receiver, and then morph that into something more complicated like a c single sideband transceiver. But our objective is, one, there was no integrated circuits in there as such. The audio amplifier is a de discrete component amplifier. It does not have an, an LM386 or 380 in there. And, and we tried to use all common parts. As a matter of fact, the double balance mixers, instead of using an ADE1 or TUF1 or SBL1, they were all homebrew. And with this article, there's some links in there to YouTube videos that show you how to make the double balance mixer homebrew it. There's three of them. So the idea was uh, people were people kind of shying away from homebrew and said, it's too hard. I don't know enough about it. And so this was sort of like a, a, a large array of information to get you started, but not to leave you there and say, oh, yeah, build a double balance mixer. OK, you go to the YouTube video and it shows you how to build a double balance mixer and some of the things you need to do. And, and I, I think the, the part of the issue is some of this is a little black magic that, that people shy away from, but they just grab four diodes and two cores and say, OK, I'm there. And you got to do a little bit more than that. And, I, and that we tried to promote the fact that, yeah, this is not that difficult, but you have to do some front end stuff like match diodes. And how you wind the, wind the ferrite cores is important. You can, just can't scramble one, some wires in there and say, oh, these will work. You know, you got to evenly space it and take advantage of the properties of what that transformer will really do. So the list builds something. Uh, there's there's four links here. You can see a picture of what, what the front cover looked like. Then the two pieces that deal with starting with the direct conversion receiver and then stepping up to a full transceiver. And then, uh, well... Uh, part three was the, the surface mount is for the article. I took a two foot by two foot board. <laughs> so I had this breadboard. So it worked really well. But to carry that thing around, it's a little hard to tuck it under your arm. And take it <laughs> yeah, somewhere. I imagine. So so this this I said, let's see, it was shrink it down. But there were some things that I learned with surface mount. You know, it's it's interesting how we take things for granted with with uh, point to point wiring. You want to test something, measure something, you just click on a, a convenient point with your scope probe and you're there. With surface mount, there are none of those. Right. So how do, how do you deal with that? So I learned something about tombstoning where you, you find an area on the circuit board instead of mounting a, a 0.01 cap or a 100 nanofarad cap flat, you mount it vertical, solder the bottom end down, and then the top part is the test point. And I learned oh, also oh. some other things about... Uh, values of resistors the surface mount do not have <clears throat> the the higher wattage ratings that you may need like typically yep. if you build something with uh, leaded components a uh, quarter watt half watt eh, it's okay some of these are 16th watt <laughs> and you got them in a bias circuit and suddenly you have this puff of smoke <laughs> because you've exceeded the, the wattage capability of it so i mean some of the things you need to really Pay a I ordered, oh, yeah, there's a surface mount. Just order those. And I didn't bother to look at the wattage. And so you put them in the circuit. And next thing you know, you got big, big mushroom cloud over the top of your project. So some things that you learn to do that. But it can't be done in, in a surface mount. Uh, I, I think one of my blog posts I mentioned just here recently that if you're going to start building stuff, some people are sharing away from the surface mount. But you can't. Because soon the leaded components are not available. The only thing yeah. that you can buy is in the surface mount. So yeah, it's almost it's, impossible to find them. Yeah. So you better you better move now to the surface mount, 
or give up because just or you're going to pay a premium for some guy's got a bag of stuff and and says, oh, yeah, you want to let it component? This is what the price is. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. It makes it kind of difficult to uh, uh, to put things together. I mean, nowadays with a lot of these components, you end up having to buy some adapter boards so that you can actually do prototyping, quick prototyping. Um, so you're not constantly trying to solder these little chips in. And I mean, it makes it, I, I like uh, Manhattan style prototyping. So I'm, you know, it, it, it makes it a lot more difficult with all the surface mount stuff. Yeah. Well, there's a good answer to that. And, and it's a $250,000 answer. Okay. I have, a C, <laughs> I have a CNC machine and it only cost me $250,000. And I, I say that jokingly, but uh, my number three son, uh, as I said, a mechanical engineer, it cost me $250,000 to send him engineering school. And uh, when he graduated about oh, almost a year later, he shows up the, at the house one day. He says, here, here's a CNC machine I designed and built for you. He said, we're even. <laughs> well, <laughs> I said, even? He said, yeah. He said, this, this, is, this is a result of your investment. So I ended up with a CNC machine, and he ended up with a mechanical engineering degree. But having a CNC machine takes care of that problem, Dan, because uh, what, I, what I've done is I've designed a lot of boards. And the thing is, I've got a – instead of designing a whole board, you know, a whole board for a circuit, I've designed little modules. Like for the ADE1, which is a really nice double balance mixer, and you can buy them at Mauser and DigiKey, five, six bucks. But they're surface mount. So I've designed some pads for that. And so if I want a double balance mixer one place on the on the circuit board, I'll just X marks the spot, call up the program, cut it there. If I want it, another one over here, X marks the spot, call up the program, there you are. And so I've committed a lot of these. And I don't, the, my designs using the uh, CNC are not like you typically think. I, I use what I call the island squares, which is, it's almost like Manhattan, except you're doing it right on the top of the PC board. Yep. So you move things around. And the, the beauty of that is you, you screw up the board. Uh, a lot of guys sent the stuff off to China, which is okay. And they get pretty good pricing on it. But you screw up a board, you don't have another one. You're going to have to wait three weeks or two weeks to get another board. And uh, the CNC machines uh, today have really come down in price. Uh, you can uh, get a pretty good now there's an example with the surface mount it was all done with the cnc machine and uh so the thing is you can get a, a good pretty good machine will do that level of work for about 300 bucks and i mean a couple of years ago these were almost a grand so yep. uh so 300 dollars is probably worth the investment if you're going to do that and if you did five or six boards a year uh, you know, you're going to have this thing for a little while. It's pretty good. The other nice part is it's not only making printed circuit boards, but you got this panel and you need, want to put this LCD in the, in the panel. How do you do that? And so the, the thing is you just, you have a, I have a template for the LCD and I say, okay, cut the hole here. And you cut a, cut a nice hole. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, there was one project. Now I, I have, both the CNC and the manual mill. And interesting how I ended up with a manual mill. And the number three son says, hey, I got this idea about building conversion kits for manual mills. He said, how about fronting me a CNC machine? He says, we build these adapters. He said, we'll make a fortune. He says, you buy the adapter kit and you turn the manual into a CNC. And he says, Guy, guy's got a lot of manual mills. Well, he did it. But the problem is most of the manual mills that you can get for six, $700, they're not accurate enough. In other words, you're far more accurate in the electronics package than what the machine is capable of doing. So it didn't work out too too well from that standpoint. So I ended up with a manual mill. But if you look on uh, my QRZ.com page, you'll see a Heath kit, HW101, where I took the semicircular window that is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is on the Heath kits, and I converted that to a rectangle. Well, there, there, you, there, you can see that. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that in the. Oh, you're, oh, you're scrolling down. Okay, keep scrolling down. Keep going. And I was able to do that on with a manual mill, and it, it almost looks like it was built by. Well, I built a lot of crap. Keep going. 
By the way, CRAP is the official acronym for Cool Radios and Projects. <laughs> Keep going. Coming up. No, you must have won by it. Back. There, right there. Next, one down. There it is. Look at that Heath kit. HW101, and it's got the LCD in, in where the semicircular was. Oh, that's pretty cool. And I was able to precisely line up where the LCD was going to go, so that looks like it was built in the factory. Yeah. It sure beats doing that stuff with a Dremel tool. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> For sure. It does. It does. Uh, but anyway, the, the thing is, our, our hobbies, of course, I don't have a 3D printer, but that's the other thing. Guys are 3D printing stuff all over the place. I, I want a case. Matter of fact, uh, I just got my recent uh, GRQP, GQRP Club Sprat magazine, and a guy has built a transmitter in a matchbox, and it's called the matchbox transmitter. I mean, just a regular little matchbox. I looked at it and I said, how the heck did he do that? And he says, yeah, he says, how I did it is I 3D printed the box. Then he took the label off of a matchbox <laughs> and glued hey. it up. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like the matchbox. But he says, yeah, I just took my 3D printer and created a box. So there you go. Yeah, that's cool. fun. All right. Well, so um, modular construction. I, I uh, yeah. There's... Can we talk a little bit about that? Because I, I think that there may be people, you know, new people who may not understand that that is the approach that we take when we are building a transceiver. You start you start with like a one module of that uh, transceiver and work on that, right? Right. Now, I'm going to give you an acronym. FOAM. F-O-A-M. FOAM. So that any transceiver project has got FOAM in it. And the four elements are filters, oscillators, amplifiers, and mixers. Boom. That's what it is. Boom. And there's a good reason for building things in modules because if you start at the back end and build the audio amplifier and get that working, that then becomes a part of the test system. Because then what you can do is build a product detector. You know the amplifier works. You build a product detector, and you got that product detector working because you can hear it detecting through the through the audio amplifier. Then the next stage you build is the IF module, because then then you you know that the product detector is working. You know the audio amplifier is working, and you know that the IF module is working because you you can introduce a signal into the IF and then copy it there. Well, I did it alphabetically, but if you do it foam, it's easier to remember. Filters, oscillators, amplifiers, and mixers. Boom. So anything you do, it's just, and it's just like the, the Legos there. It's a building block. Now, the other thing I always consider when I build a, a radio is by building in modules, it becomes an experimenter's platform. For instance, you, you say, well, I have this audio amplifier. It's got a little hiss in it. It's kind of a little tepid. I'd like to try a new audio amplifier. So all I do is unsolder the input, take off the output, take off the power, put a new module in there, and I haven't changed anything else in the radio. So this way I'm able to look at everything ahead of that I know is working because I, I have the, the module that I'm replacing. And so you're able to do a comparative analysis. Hey, that's a lot better. It's got more volume, less noise, uh, smaller size, uh, cheaper to build. And so we're going to put there. So then all you do is screw that down in your box or on the board, and, and you've changed it without destroying the whole radio. If you have one huge circuit board, you know, where do you start? And the other thing, too, is if you if you end up um, fi finding you've got a problem, it's pretty easy to isolate things in terms of the module. You say, look, I hear sound. I my quick test for the audio amplifier. Take the input, put your finger on it. You get a you get a hum out of the speakers. So that's working, you know. <laughs> so this way, there's things that you can do to to test these to find the faulty module instead of hunting and pecking all over the the circuit board. Now, there's there's lots of things that you you find and discover. Um, there's a couple of good publications that that I I find very useful. And 
you always hear people talk about EMFRD. That's the Experimental Methods for RF Design. That's a Wes Hayward book. I don't like that magazine as or that book as, as well as I do with every publication called Solid State Design for the Radio Amateur. And the reason is SSDRA has a lot of stuff in it that is easy. To, you don't have to have a lot of foreknowledge. You can just follow right along. And it's got a little small segments that you can work on and some really good stuff in there. And he built, he had a product, project in there called a competition grade CW receiver. It's near the end of the publication. And I looked at that and I said, you know, I'm going to build that. But I said, I'm going to do something different. So I, I found a sale on aluminum mini boxes. And I ended up putting every one of the circuit element modules in a mini box. So it had the feed through capacitors, RCA jacks and everything. So when you looked at it, all you saw is all these mini boxes screwed down to a chassis. And everything was labeled. And that was the worst thing I did because <laughs> when something went awry, where do you start testing? I mean, you, you got to open up the mini box to get in there to find out what the problem with the circuit is. So sometimes, you know, this, this was a great idea of mine, but not a great idea to implement it in the hardware. But with the modules, uh, there was another project I built called the J-Bomb. And J-Bomb is an acronym for just a bunch of modules. But there I, I created um, shielded boxes out of PC board, but I had access to them so that you could get in there and find out what the problem is. So, I mean, I got just as, as effective of having a sealed box building one these modules with the shielding all around them. So, I mean, there's some things you need to do, but if you're able to work on a particular area, easy, easy to isolate the problem from troubleshooting. And that's, just, uh, that's another issue is that uh, design for manufacturing the assembly, DFMA, going back to my production roots when I worked for McDonnell Douglas. So many times these radios, when they build them, no one really thinks that you're going to have to service them. Uh, I happen to have a, a Yaesu FTDX100. Now, I didn't say FTDX101. That's okay. the latest one. But the FTDX100 was built in 1967, and it was mostly solid state, but it had three tubes in it. But the solid states were all germanium transistors. They did not sell many of the FTDX transceivers here in the United States. It was mostly test marketing around the world. And if you can get your hands on one of those, they're a pretty nice radio. I, I managed to find one. But no one thought about having the services. They have the filter capacitors in, in the chassis, and they have all this wiring all over the top of it. There's absolutely no way, if you need to replace those filter capacitors, to unsolder any of the wires. You have to literally disassemble that radio. And a couple of the circuits, they've got them in a sealed, and I'm talking about sealed, like soldered shut box. The circuits are in there. There's no way to get it. If there's a suspect problem with that, I don't know how you deal with it. So someone said, hey, it works. This is great. Let's pop them out the door. But they don't think about the service guy that has to fix this thing downstream. And so the same thing when you're building in modules it enables you to think about that and how you build the modules and how you put them in the radio. So it says, I may have to service this someday. And so this is what we need to do is build them such a way as you can actually get access and do the testing. But yeah. the modules are the way to go. And, you know, you start with the front end. Now, the thing is, I have some um, some pet circuits that I've developed over the years, and they, they seem to work pretty well. But every once in a while, you need to challenge your stuff because – all you're building, if you keep building new radios new, using everything but these same circuits, all you have is a new front panel, but it's the same radio. So you maybe never get to the point of start doing things to try experimenting to see new capabilities or technology or new ways to do things. So, um, But the modules let you do it because then you can do it incrementally. Say, I'm going to try this here incrementally. For instance, there's a wonderful transistor called the BFR-106. BFR-106, not very expensive. They're a surface mount. And these things are good in the gigahertz range, and you can get some power out of them, but you have to have, yeah, they're surface mount. You're going to have to do something to utilize those. So now a lot of the stuff, I used to put a 2N3904 in. I'll now put a BFR-106 in because it's a better device that has, a, instead of the FT being like 300 megahertz, this thing is like gigahertz. So you have a much better output, and they're small, and and they have a good uh, 
good uh, collector dissipation. So you can get a little power out of those things. So the BFR 106. Yeah. Cool. So I put uh, your blog link with uh, with this uh you know this this article because you have a great blog and so the blog is is n6qw.blogspot.com and this and that's where this article is that you wrote just i think yesterday or or something yeah uh, on yeah on the uh on on modular building and it's it's a really great uh, little uh piece there so thanks for doing that uh uh, Pete. So what, let's do this. Let's go look at the comments here for a second, and then I'll turn. I'll I'll give uh, Dan another chance to ask more questions. There's a few comments in here. Uh, one from uh, Doug Bo, uh, KD7DUG. He says, "This is fantastic. I'm glad I caught you all live." So yeah, thanks. That's good. Um, then we have uh, Jason. What's the two valve device behind him? So. What is that device behind you there, Pete? Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, I read an article one time in CQ Magazine about the brilliance of the German engineers, electronic engineers during World War II. And the brilliance was when they built their field radios out in the field, these were kind of like almost like regen receiver and a one or two two tube transmitter they used the same tube in every socket same tube in every socket and you lift the case lid and there's one spare tube in there and the one spare tube <laughs> can be put anywhere in that radio and i said that's going to be brilliant you know if the radio is but what do you do where, where do i get a spare tube it's in the lid so a couple of years ago well listen more than a couple of years ago maybe like 25 years ago I started work on a transceiver using six AK-5 tubes, 13 six AK-5 tubes. Wow. And everywhere everywhere in the circuit was a six AK-5 tube. And I did, get, uh, I did get the receiver working. And then it was one of those things. I had a job-related move, and I just, I just couldn't put any time on it. And there was a guy that I knew. He says, oh, he says, oh that's pretty cool. I said, here, let me give it to you. I said, it's not all done. At least the receiver works. So recently here, recently, I needed a 6BA6 tube for one of my tube type transceivers. I didn't have any around. I said, I better better get some. So there was this guy selling 15 6BA6 tubes for $2.68 on eBay. And the shipping was seven dollars, so it was nine dollars and sixty-eight cents for fifteen tubes. So I reason, even if I only get one out of the fifteen, which I'm looking for, nine dollars and sixty-eight cents was probably a pretty good price to pay for shipping. Yeah. So fifteen tubes show up, a couple are new in box, and they all work. So wow. I ended up with fifteen tubes. So I said, yeah. okay. Time to time to dust off, dust off that design again, and start working that. And what that is, is is a driver stage with six BA sixes. Now I didn't get too far in this because I got overtaken by what with with the health of my XYL. But I have built the audio amplifier stage that uses a six BA six as a preamp and a six BA six. Actually, you can get almost 500 milliwatts out of a 6BA6 for an audio amplifier, which is probably okay, <laughs> you know, an LM386, so 3400 400 milliwatts, so that, that'd work. It's not room filling, but you put a pair of headphones in. So that was the test circuit for the 6BA6 in, in the transmitter side. Now, what I did is I said, well, well how am I going to test this thing? So I have a solid state exciter that, didn't have the driver in the final stage. So I was driving that with the solid state exciter and you get a really nice pair. There's a couple of YouTube videos that you can actually see the, the pattern coming off those six VA six. So that was the breadboard for that. And I said, I need a background for today. I said, this ought to stir a little of interest. And it did. It did. It did. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Let's see what else we got. We have uh, Lee says SMT 
uh, I think you meant SMD, maybe, I don't know. Parts yep. can be had in larger sizes, but they're still small. Yeah, yep. <laughs> they're small no matter what. Yeah. Well, don't go anything less than 805. You get some of these 406s, <laughs> you, there's no way you can see them. Uh, you need a pick and place manipulator to put them on the circuit board. But the 1206 and the 805 can be out. The 1206 are really pretty easy with a pair of tweezers. So yep. when yeah. I design my pads, I typically look at, at an 805 or 1206 size, and usually you can find what you need in those sizes. Yeah, yep. And then uh, Andy says this is a very is very enjoyable. Thanks. Well, thank you too. Uh, and then uh, our friend Kyle Alpha Alpha Zero Z, he says yo, which means he's in the house. <laughs> and then uh, you know this is this is one here. Look at this. Uh, we've got Todd. He says Charlie, thanks for inspiring me to uh, uh, this uh, Florida Poda guy to do a six point soda in California. Well. The interesting thing, I'm so glad that I inspired you, but $20 he donated, Pete. So uh, when, uh, and that's because of you, I'm sure. So when uh, I'm in California next time, I'm going to have to come buy you a hamburger or something. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Well, so I think that's it for right now in the chat. So uh, we'll turn it over to see if Dan has any other questions. Uh, I'll probably have one or two more, and then we're almost out of time. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I just want to pass about, about this. Speaking of the poda or soda, yeah, this is a this is a twenty meter single sideband transceiver, a one watt. Be perfect for the for whatever you're gonna do. The iota that's that's the island on the air. Some guy was packed parked at an abandoned gas station. Says I'm doing island on the air. <laughs> he, he was parking a gas island, but uh, this is really neat. Uh, and uh, you can see this link is on my is on my web page up at the top. N6QW. The actual QRP quarterly article about building these this transceiver is up at the top, so you can download that. And if you're interested in building it, the circuit diagrams might be there. But this is this is something perfect for taking up on top of a mountaintop. Doesn't weigh very much with a battery in that and in a watt and a pretty good antenna. You you'll make quite a few contacts. Yeah, let's show a little bit of video on that here. So there you this. Go. And towards step. It's a really nice display. Got a little whole bunch of colors in there. And the thing that's funny is um, there's a matrix that tells you what what hex code to put in for the colors, except uh, the N6QW is green, but actually you call out magenta. And uh, so for Let's 16 see cubic inches. It got so hot, it smoked the after, it smoked the IR throw. I'm looking for so some of the build though, part here. Uh, here it is, I think. <clears throat> Transceiver. And so there we are. So there's some of the pictures, right? That's a BFR-106. That board, that's, that's a little circuit board, less than a uh, half inch wide, one inch long. I needed an RF amplifier. It's an untuned RF amplifier. It's got the BFR-106, all surface mount parts. And I built that on my CNC. Yeah, and then there's some other. It's it just it, this goes through and t it kind of talks about uh, how your build. Here's another picture of it. Uh, you know, it's it's really a and I mean, if this was a commercial radio, it'd sell. Yeah, it's really nice. So tell me again where where you can find out the information on how to build it. It's on your your spot again. Your uh, you, your it's on my w website n6qw.com. Let's see if we can bring that up. N6QW.com. That's less build something, but it's gonna, if I just back out of some of yeah. that, right? And well, up, to, up to the index page. Okay, there it is. A 20 meter shirt pocket SSB transceiver. That link. There it is. Actually, I built two of them. The one on the left was the was the first one. And the one on the right is the one you see, but that's before I added the, it would use the VXO. That the one on the right is 16 cubic inches, two by two by four. And then I added an upper deck and a new front and back panel to it. So you have the LCD with the Arduino. Hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. So yeah, here's here's the instructions on how to build it. Yep. Cool. What, what crystal did you use? The uh, IF is 4.9152 megahertz. And that's a really good choice if you're going to homebrew a crystal filter. Good enough for the K2, 
uh, Ella Craft, <laughs> good, good yeah. enough for here. And the reason the 4.9512 is really good, a lot of people use 9 megahertz, and it doesn't work too well on 17 meters. So with a 49152, you can put that on literally any amateur band and not worry about having the VFO ended up as a second harmonic as is a transmitted signal. So it works really, really well. And you can put the the uh, frequency above so that you s solve any problems with the second order or the, the uh, some difference ended up through the bandpass filter. Yeah. So like for, for instance, I built a 17 meter uh, version of, of using the 49152, and I found out you can buy 11.5 megahertz crystals, and I used them in a VXO, and then frequency doubled them using a diode doubler, so it ends up at 23 megahertz. So 23 minus the 49152 puts you right at 18.125. So you're right there on 17 meters. Yeah, that's perfect. Cool. Uh, um, so. Let's see what else I was going to ask you real quick on that. Oh, I was going to ask you to show it again. So now that I got you blown up, show that, uh, hold that up again, that uh, radio. Yeah, look at that, guys. That's uh, that's really, really cool looking. Nice. And it's small, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right, Dan. What, uh, what do you got? Anything? Well, I was kind of curious, you know, um, trying to you know when you inspire people to to do builds and especially modular builds and things what kind of test tools and and hand tools would you recommend you know as you start out on this kind of adventure well interestingly enough aside from the cnc mostly most of the most significant piece of hand tool equipment that you could get is a six inch wide vise <laughs> Because you can do a lot of metal bending with a vise and holding the parts and things like that, but a, a good uh, a good electric drill, and of course what I use is my manual CNC as, as the drill because it drills fairly accurate straight holes, and the normal array of hand tools. Uh, you know, I, I'd avoid buying hand tools from Harbor Freight. I'd invest oh, yeah. a good pair, a good pair of uh, needle nose pliers that you pay maybe twenty bucks for, some good nippers. I have a. Uh, Siglent 200 megahertz DSO, which is really important. And then I have a, a 60 megahertz um, uh, signal generator. So with those those two devices, you can do a lot of testing. And of course, the very popular thing today is the nano VNA. Everybody's yes. buying a nano VNA or a nano SA. And the, the problem with that is sometimes people put them, don't understand what the machine will do. Or, or the test will do, and they get they get results that, that they right away have no way of really understanding what they're seeing is telling them something, and uh, they don't understand what they're seeing. As a good example, and I shared this with Charlie yesterday. Also on my website is a, called the the PSSST transceiver. It's a seven transistor single sideband transceiver. PSSST, and that's on n6qw.com. And uh, it's being built by a group. And as a matter of fact, now there's a uh, uh, a company that's actually offering a kit, a formal kit. I have no connection with the company, but they they asked to use the design, and they're selling this as a kit. And uh, so, in there, you have to construct a bandpass filter. And uh, and a guy built the bandpass filter, and he put his nano VNA on it, and he saw this pattern, and he said, "What's wrong with your design? Look what I got." I said, there's nothing wrong with the design. What's wrong with your build? What he didn't realize was he was getting a very peaked response on the nano VNA, which immediately told me he has too small of a coupling capacitor. The section coupling capacitor is too small. And if it was too large, you'd get a double hump response. If it's too small, you get a peak response. And if you got the right size, you get the nice flat type response that you're looking for. And so to that end, I think... Time invested using a speaking of tools, a free tool is LT Spice simulation mm -hmm. software. And I spent a lot of time with the simulation software. Immediately when I saw that, I said, I don't know what the problem is. It's too small of a capacitor in there. So then I asked him, I said, What did you put in there? Well, as it turned out, he had the wrong value capacitor in there. But immediately he started off, Your design's wrong. There's something wrong with your design. And he said, Because look at my result on the nano VNA. He just didn't, people need to understand what they're seeing. 
And if you yeah. don't, you jump immediately putting the tool in there and seeing a response, you have nowhere to go but this, other than say it's a bad design. Now, there can be bad designs. Uh, hey, far from me to say that there isn't. But what are you seeing? And if you invest the time in LT spaces, and I even suggested, I said, take the design in LT spice, make the capacitor too small, make it too big, and then display it. And you'll see. <laughs> you don't even use the nano VNA. You'll see. There was a life before a nano VNA. So my my only concern is that people take these instruments and don't don't really understand what they're doing, and then right away jump to a conclusion and jump to the wrong conclusion. So anyway, uh, uh, certainly having simulation software, like a, a signal, signal generator, signal generator, and a good array of good quality hand tools. You know, uh, the other thing too is working with a surface mount. You need a headband magnifier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you can see those parts and, and, and some tweezers. Now, the other thing that you find that just drives me nuts, somehow a lot of my tools got magnetized. And I don't know how that happened, but they ended up getting magnetized. And maybe I had some magnetized screwdrivers and they're in a toolbox. And I'll be darned if you're not trying to put that little part down there and it sticks <laughs> because the part gets magnetized. I mean, the the, the end solder ends are, you know, get, get something in there that acts like a magnet. So you got to get some, you got to find some parts that aren't, aren't magnetized to work with the sm small surface mount devices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, follow up at all? Uh, or is that good, Dan? No, that's good. Okay. All right. Well, okay, so... Do you, okay, it's kind of a two-part question. When you start a new build, kind of what's your approach, your initial planning and preparation stage? And then also, as part of that, do you do like a breadboard or do you do a physical layout or how do you how do you get going? Okay. Well, first of all, and I always say this, and uh, a very there's a couple really well-known homebrewers that disagree with me in this. I say the last thing I turn on is the soldering iron. First thing I do is turn on the noodling process, and you, you can do this with a on the back of an envelope. I save all the envelopes <laughs> and use it for <laughs> scratch paper. You know, you just lay it. I say, okay, I'm going to have a front end. I'm going to need an RF amplifier. I'm going to have a mixer. I'm going to need a a, a, a local oscillator. I'm going to need a, a IF amplifier stage. I need a product detector. I need an audio amplifier. So then you have these blocks. And, and it's just like they do in, seriously in industry. They start with a block diagram. What is it that you want to do? Do we want to have one band or two band? And how do we want to do this? For instance, uh, what's been very popular is the bilateral circuitry. And there's lots of ways to do bilateral. And just recently here with the PSST, instead of having a bilateral circuitry, I have a single pass circuit. And what I did is with relay steering is I'll move the direction of that whole module. Instead of making the module bilateral, and I have quite a few transceivers with that, I found the steering because you can optimize that particular stage for one direction signal flow. And then with the relay steering, you can we can move it around so that it's used in the trans transmit or in the receive chain. So I usually do that, and then I start filling in the box. Say, okay, I need an audio amplifier. And I look, and if you go back to the phone process, Right. So uh, audio amplifiers under A, uh, there's audio and RF amplifier. What would I do? Would I use discrete components? Would you use an LM386? Uh, there's there's modules you can buy from Amazon for like three, four bucks. You get four audio amplifiers, and they're, they're good enough if you want something quick and dirty, and they're small, and they're modular. Or is it something that you're going to build with something with a little more oomph to it, like an LM380 with a couple watts out? So then you fill in the box and and then you get to see uh, is there an opportunity to do something a little bit differently now just recently one of the other things i'm noodling on right now and i i spent some time noodling it with lt spice to prove it worked one of the most useful transistors that i find for for rf purposes in a driver stage is a 2n2219a 2n2219a now interestingly enough the 2n2222 a is the same die as the 2N2219A, except it doesn't have the same dissipation. They're exactly the same identical transistor. And the useful part of that is, if you go to LT Spice, that's one of the libraries they've got in there. 
So it's real easy to you put a 2N22 or 2N2219A in there and use it. But then I said, you know, why am I limiting myself? Why can't I use a PNP device instead of the, the 2N2219A? And a complementary part to that is a 2N2905. So a 2N2905 PNP is the same as the 2219A NPN. So I'm going to do some experimenting using PNP transistors. There's no reason why you can't use them. It's just everything seemed to gravitate to NPN because guess what? You ground the emitter <laughs> instead of grounding the collector. <laughs> Easy to understand. So I have I have come up with a design that I've taken the 2N2219A in LT Spice and converted it to 2905. And I bought a bag of 10 2905s for a lot cheaper than I can buy a 2219A. If that works, then that will go in the block. So this this you start with a piece of paper, block diagram, look at the blocks, and then you decide what, what's the optimum way to, to use that block. And, and it's just a, you use that process over and over again, and you can pretty much design everything in LT Spice, and you can even put connect the circuits together in LT Spice so that you can say, okay, I got a product detector and an audio amplifier, put those on there, and you can actually test it. You'll actually see if you get an output. So I, I think that's the useful part is start with the block diagram, then to the circuit simulation. And to answer your question, very frequently I build two, the prototype and then the final product. And the prototype is where it's messy. <laughs> it's got all solder blobs and all the changes take place and it doesn't look too nice, but it works. And then you convert that if you want something that you say, hey, look at this. It looks pretty nice. That's usually the second build. So there's there's a lot to the prototype. And the other thing with the prototype, and it's, you know, essentially if you do it in modules, you have all these modules. Sometimes you just want to try a quick and dirty project. You just reach in the box for the modules that you've already built and know the work that have been tested. And you put together something pretty quickly. So there's a, there's a good benefit to prototyping with, with a circuit. So when you buy parts, buy parts for two, not just one. Got it. Yeah. So you don't breadboard. You just build it and then re and then build it another one. You yeah. just use, use LT Spice. Well, I do use a breadboard because I have the modules and I put the holes in and screw them down there and move things around. That ah. the other aspect of the using a, a chunk of wood like that, you can see optimally sometimes some things. Like for instance, in the NE602, and that's on the uh, sudden we're using the NE602s. You'll see something interesting in there. I started, this thing was starting to grow pretty big. So I said, well, let's do this. So I put the main circuit board right in the middle of, of, the, of the transceiver. And the ancillary circuit boards are on the side. But instead of being horizontal, they're vertical. And they got good access either side vertical because you can make any circuit adjustments. But it looks kind of weird because some of them are standing vertically, but the main board is horizontal. So you get a chance to see what the, what the modules then using the breadboard say how can i compress this thing or move things around that you do two things one you can compact the design but the other part of it is you you look at unwanted circuit paths so you don't get any unwanted feedback from you know the out, the output of one is in the input of the other and that's not going to work so you're going to get some feedback so you need to do some things like that to make sure that you're the way you arrange it finally is you're not going to build yourself a trap yeah cool all right so um let's do this i'm gonna answer we're gonna acknowledge a couple more people in chat then i'm gonna let uh dan have his final question then i'm gonna ask a final question and then then we're gonna give you pete uh, an opportunity to wrap things up and we'll call right. it good because we're already over time this is just so fun and, and appreciate you being here so let's see todd says this is gold i've been building for four days in may so Todd, I, I want hopefully if you're there this year, I'm going to be at four. I'm going to be at four days in May this year. So let's uh, let's meet up and uh, again, thank you for that donation. I really appreciate it. And then um, and another one from Todd. It looks like he says, "I I love to get a, a what does it say? I'd love to get an <laughs> IV drip of what pizza." <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Todd. Me too. Me too. I don't know if I could handle all that uh, all that brainy stuff though. Uh, very good. All right, uh, Dan, do you have any final, any, one last question for Pete? Yeah, it's mostly technique, you know. I mean, the worst thing that that I have problems with is winding torades, whether they're, you know, well, torades in general. You pick your flavor. Um, 
is there a easy way to do that and uh, know that you've got a good valid tour rate for your project? Well, I just count the turns. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of hard. You, you can't lose count. And, uh, you know, the other thing, too, is there were some test instruments that are no longer available that were very, very useful. Um, a guy by the name of Neil Morrison, who's a silent key now, uh, up in Auburn, Washington, uh, started a company called Almost All Digital Electronics, AADE. And he built an LC meter. It cost you 100 bucks for this LC meter. But it is one. if you can get your hands on one of those, now there's probably comparable ones. But that was kind of the gold standard, and so typically, once you once you build the uh, once you build the toroid, you can test it with the AAD meter. I happen to have one. Unfortunately, I've got one. Now the, the thing is, you'll find is that people just scramble on stuff in there, and they go and look at even spacing. So once you're done building the toroid with a re requisite number of turns, this is where you take some time you, with the fingernail kind of space those things so they're evenly around the core and you got a gap at the bottom and then make your measurement so many times the guys will wind them all of one part leave a big open thing and then the inductance is wrong because you've actually increased the inductance by compressing the turns and the other thing too is is to be pretty careful now amadon used to have this neat little look like a road map actually it does it looks like two-sided road map and they list the core sizes and they list the wire size, and it tells you how many turns of wire you can put on that specific size core. Like if you have number 26, it'll take so many turns. 28 will take more turns. The trick is to, to have sizes of wire so that you'll pretty much fill the core so that you're not having this wire floppy all over the place because it's going to change inductance values on you. So I have like, I have 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, and 30. So, so those there typically, and then I look at I look at the core, core size you're going to use, and then I try to match the wire to the number of turns. It's pretty much going to fill that, so you're not going to get a lot of, a lot of compression that you get it changed values. But it's always a good idea to measure those. And I guess with a nano VNA you could measure them certainly, but the AAD is an LC meter, which then gives you the capability to measure individual capacitors. That's another thing too is avoid buying those grab bag bags you know 400 capacitors for two bucks <laughs> because none of the values that are marked on the capacitors are the right value too Trust good to me. be true that sounds like too a good to be true yeah. <laughs> so it's it's always good to change you'll find that things are sometimes are mismatched or misidentified you know they'll say it's a 220 and it's not uh, so you it's always good if you have an an lc meter to be able to measure those capacitors especially where it's questionable where, where they're made. And there's so much of that going on. It's, it's, or their outfall. In other words, it's supposed to be a 220 picofarad, and it's only 180. He said, not, yeah, it's not too bad. It's, it works. But you've got 180 and you need a 220, and you're wondering why the, the, the frequency is in the bandpass filter is right, because you have what, what's marked there is not actually what the part is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So my question then, uh, this will be my last question, I think, and that is, who did you or who do you draw inspiration from regarding homebrew radio? Uh, and, you know, kind of who, who, who is it that uh, you drew inspiration from or, or do you draw inspiration from somebody right now? And uh, then kind of how, how uh, what, what do you like most about homebrew? I mean, what brings you, th why, what brings you this, the joy of homebrew? Well, it actually was a practical thing, uh, Charlie. Uh, keep in mind, I was doing this in the 50s, and you just didn't have Amazon. <laughs> and you didn't go go to your computer and say, hey, I want one of those and order it. I mean, if you wanted something, you had to build it. And that's why I think in many respects, the QSTs and the CQs, uh, the mag ham radio and 73 magazines that, at that time were, were very much in vogue is because they had projects. People said, I need this, and there it was, and you could build it. So a lot of this, a lot of the building came out from, from a practical side is, oh, I want it. I'm going to have to build it. You can't can't buy that. Today, you can buy literally anything, but not so much as you, people are building it. So I think 
I started off that way, just building and trying things and experimenting and then, and then finding out what's right and what's wrong. But I think there's a couple of guys that are, are today or still around with us that, that are there's some guys that were really great, like Lou McCoy in he used to write for QSD. He's a silent key. Uh, Doug DeMaw, uh, silent key. But certainly Wes Hayward uh, would be one guy that really has got a you like to be like Wes Hayward, know what he knows. Another one is uh, VU2 ESC Farhan, who came up with BIDX and, and all the ver variants on the BIDX. Quite an interesting chap. So, I mean, these guys, they just see things that you don't always see, and, and they find find ways to do things. But that's another thing, too, is that uh, I think there's some opportunities if you can just look at things a little bit differently. For instance, and uh, just kind of, wrap things up. Uh, Tentec made some really interesting transceivers in the 1970s. And one of the first uh, solid state transceivers they made was called the Triton 1 and Triton 2. And the Triton 1 was a 50 watt PEP unit. And I think what they did is took the Argonaut and <laughs> took the outboard linear amplifier, mashed it into a box. Yeah. And then, then they came up with a Triton 2, which is a 100 watt version. So if you can find a Triton 2, pretty good now they did something which was really weird and strange and this will get to the point of home brewing today they have a pto permeability tuned oscillator in the triton 2 triton 1 and to shift bands there was no crystal mixing as such when you click the band switch to the various bands with that standard pto they introduced into the circuitry via the band switch inductors. Hmm. And these inductors changed the frequency of the singular PTO that they had in there, like at parallelum. So you're having the inductance or third in the inductance. And then following that were some transistor stages that were either a doubler or a tripler. So they used the basic PTO instead of trying to create a, an oscillator at 19 megahertz. They had an oscillator at five megahertz, and then they mixed a, uh, a inductor with it that when you tripled it, it got you to 19 megahertz. So to align this thing, I, I got a Triton 2 here not too long ago. To align this thing, you have to adjust all those coils for the individual bands so that the band, <laughs> the band on the oh. dial in its analog dial comes out right. And I spent about 20 minutes with that, and I said, that's nuts. So I just disconnected the BTO, PTO, and you'll see this on the website, the N6QW website. I created the ranges in the Arduino. So if I needed a 19 megahertz oscillator, which you do because it's a 9 megahertz IF, if you d do that, it puts you at 28. 9 plus 19 gives you 28. That's 10 meters. There you go. So then the LCD reached 10 meters. And for, for 20 meters, it used the straight 5 megahertz VFO. So I just put the offsets in a little matrix. So I did a little little fun thing with the Arduino. So now I got an external box. Bob's your uncle. The, the, the external box is the VFO. It's got an LCD display on it. The frequency is accurate. <laughs> I don't have to worry about the PTO. And it's one wire you disconnect in the Triton. One wire. And then I went on to look and saw that if you could get your hands on a Helicrafters uh, SR160, or SR150, which had a nonlinear VFO in it, they, they had some really superb radios. But at the, at the CWN, the band spread was that wide, and on sideband up at the top was that wide, which, which didn't make any sense. I said, why can't you build a linear VFO? So it's pretty easy to go into these old radios and with the Arduino and SI5351. And have an external external VFO box, and it's accurate. And as a matter of fact, I did some some fun things with the with that particular uh, design. I've got I've got a keypad, so you can tune the radio from the keypad. So you want to tune it up, you just hold the button down, and the, and the frequency moves up. You want to tune it down, it goes down. It has step ratios, step function ratios, uh, the tuning step. And then I had another thing. I said, you know, we got to do some slick thing for split operation. Two of the buttons will give you 10 up or 10 down. So when you're working these contests, you know, the guy says, copy and 10 up. Just punch the button when you go to transmit, and it'll transmit 10 up or 10 down. 
and it's twenty dollars worth of parts. Twenty dollars worth of parts, and you could take a radio built in nineteen seventy. I mean, it, the train was really a good radio. I mean, I, I was impressed aside from the fact it's only got a four pole filter. The later Triton fours have a have an eight pole filter in it, so you can do this with with any of the ten tech radios. But it's a matter of taking the technology that you have today, inexpensive, twenty dollars worth of parts. And you can take one of these older radios and it really end up with something pretty neat. So the so the thing is, is just opening your mind a little bit to what can be done. And it's thinking about some of these things. Say, what do I have here? What do I got there? And how do I make these two together? But it's certainly guys like Wes Hayward and and Asher Farhan are, are of that ilk. They, they can see things that normally you just pass by and say, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. But anyway, those <laughs> yeah. are inspirational people, and um, I, I think we're lucky to have them. The, one of the problems today is uh, I don't think there's enough time spent on understanding how things work. I mean, we're, we're a victim now of just buy it now, get on the, uh, you know, get on the Internet, purchase this item, and away we go without really understanding what can be done. And I, I think... I, I think the, the the controller I built for the Triton certainly gives gives that radio a whole new life. I mean, yeah, with, sure. the PTO oh, yeah. system, with the PTO system, you might as well junk it. But taking this external box with twenty dollars worth of parts, and that that's that's on there. You'll see the video. There's a video link in there too. It shows how how it was done. So, you know, for not a lot of money <laughs> and just a little time, you can certainly take advantage of the technology. And I think that that's the thing today. We're in the golden age. We're in the golden age. They talk the golden age of radio being the 1930s. We're in the golden age today in the 2020s. And the reason is, is because this technology is available. It's cheap. I mean, really, really cheap technology. And uh, I, I'm just amazed. As a matter of fact, there's things beyond the, the Arduino. Now, if you look at the seed RP2040, I built a VFO with that. This thing has got a clock rate of 133 megahertz versus 16 with the Arduino. And it's got enough horsepower in there. You can do digital signal processing in, the, in this little microcontroller, and the price is around five bucks. I mean, yep. this, you could build an SDR radio with all the horsepower that you need in this device, five bucks. Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. All right, Pete. Well, I think we're at the end here. We've been going an hour and 25 minutes. Or two, I didn't mean to do that. I, <laughs> but I do want to thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with you this afternoon. It, it's a delight. I, I really enjoy talking about the hobby. And I think the thing is, is uh, if I could leave you with one thought is that we need to spend some time up front understanding how these radios work and what are the circuit elements instead of just lighting off the soldering iron and start soldering parts in there. Because when when you run into a problem, is what do you do? I mean, if you don't really understand the basics of it, you're you're kind of stuck. And there's a lot of good publications that describe it. And of course, lots of you really excellent YouTube videos and lots of good you, YouTube tutorials. So there's a lot of guys out there that take the time to explain what they're doing, and uh, you can learn certainly learn a lot from that. Yeah. Yep, absolutely, Pete. Thank you so much. This has just been a wealth of information. I know there's been a lot of comments about how much they appreciate you imparting your knowledge. There's just so much. I mean, we could probably sit here for another couple hours talking about more. <laughs> yeah, we really could. I'll get you started. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so anyway, we'll maybe I'm sure we'll hear, hear more on the Solder Smoke podcast. Make sure you you tell Bill hello for us. Yeah, you need to get Bill on here and, and chat with you guys because he's certainly done a lot of the front front end type of stuff and. Uh, he could share. I tend to be more of the digital guy, yeah. uh, but he's a he's a hardware defined radio guy. So he's done some really interesting things using no microcontrollers. So that yeah. that'd be that'd be a good 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 guy to have here to chat with you. He'd be an interesting interview for sure. All right. Well, so um, we will uh, I, once again appreciate you being here, Pete. It's I feel like I, I you're uh, a good friend now. Uh, you know, having you spent a few time, a little bit of time with you, and may, who knows, maybe I'll reach out to you and ask you a question or two as I'm building my. Uh, oh, stuff. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Be, be yeah. delighted to take the time to respond. Okay, good. All right, so hang tight. <laughs> don't don't uh, hang up yet. We'll we're gonna end the show and then we'll we'll catch you a little bit on the backside. But uh, sure, sure, you yeah. bet. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for for being here, Pete. And then Dan, you can uh, you can send us off, I guess. 
Well, thanks for being here, Pete. Learned a lot and uh, makes me uh, want to get the soldering iron back out again. There you go. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. All right. See you guys. 33.